today uh, a very short lunch hour session. I want to give a very short message here on the role of the Holy Spirit in our continuing series to build up the church, to create understanding and also an awareness and to bring help to the church at this hour that the Lord has announced righteousness and uh, following the conversation we had yesterday it is becoming apparent to the church that um, only the person of the Holy Spirit even as I said yesterday is the one that is capable of helping the church to be able to score all the requirements that we discussed yesterday that are supposed to be taking place in the life of the church today. Now today I want to look at the role of the Holy Spirit in the church. And because this is a lunch hour, we have less than 30 minutes to do this. I will give summary and a brief, and this will be a continuing conversation. Number one, the Holy Spirit, he comes to the church as the biggest ever gift that was given to the church. There is no greater gift that was ever given to the church by the Godhead, by the Lord Yahweh, than the Holy Spirit that came to help the church. The greatest gift that was ever given to the church, to the church of Christ, is actually the Holy Spirit. So the first role of the Holy Spirit in the church, real quick for lunch hour, is he brought us Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one that brought us Christ Jesus the Messiah, that he may come and die for the sins of men. So you really see how center and central and how significant the Holy Spirit is in the life of the church. The Holy Spirit was there from the beginning of the inception of the church because the Holy Spirit, He is the one that brought us Christ Jesus, the Redeemer, the Messiah, the Savior. In the book of Luke, chapter 1, verse 35, He says, The angel answered, again, Luke, chapter 1, verse 35, He says, The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So you see that the Holy Spirit is the one that brought us Christ the Messiah. The incarnation of Christ the Messiah was done by the Holy Spirit. He's the one that brought us the, the Savior. He brought us Christ, Jesus, the Savior. He's the one that brought God the Father, changed into God the Son, and come to us to deliver the nations, deliver humanity. And so after he brought us Christ Jesus, number two, the second role of the Holy Spirit in the church, is that the Holy Spirit actually is the one that crucified Christ Jesus the Lord. He is the one that took him to the cross and crucified him that he may complete the mission of deliverance of mankind from sin. Number three, the Holy Spirit is the one that resurrected Christ Jesus the Lord. And there's so much scripture to read, we don't have much time to read it. Uh, from the book of Romans chapter 6, we begin with Romans 6. He says here, verse 4, verse, uh, Romans 6, verse uh, 4. Verse 4, he says, you can read the whole chapter though. But he says, from verse 4, there are four, King James, there are four, we are buried with him in baptism into death, like Christ, like that, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, so even we also should we also should walk in newness of life. I'm reading NIV here. It says, it says, 
we therefore, we were buried with him through the baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. The book of Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, verse 24. Acts chapter 2, verse 24. It says the following. Acts chapter 2, verse 24. He says, um, But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Romans 8, 11. The Holy Spirit resurrected the Messiah. Romans 8, 11, he says, And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who lives in you. And many other scriptures, so you see very clearly that the third role of the Holy Spirit in the church is that the Holy Spirit resurrected Christ the Messiah and gave the church this wonderful hope of resurrection. And under that you have Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 14 and also Second Corinthians chapter 13 verse 4. Now, in the church, the Holy Spirit is called the Counselor and that means he comes to counsel. He comes as a counselor. That means he's an advisor. He comes to advise the church. That is the fourth role of the Holy Spirit in the church. As a consultant, he comes to coach as a coach, as an instructor to the believers, as a teacher, a trainer, a guide, a confident, a mentor, he comes as a helper, as an aid, A-I-D-E. He comes as a teacher to teach the church, instructor, and coach. Now, I want to look at, uh, real quick, because this is lunch hour session, I want to look at some very important uh, roles of the Holy Spirit, and even the genesis of the Holy Spirit in the church, how the Holy Spirit got involved with the church. Now, the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 18, we're going to read. But before we go there, if you go to Genesis, chapter 2, verse 7, then you see right from the beginning how the Holy Spirit began to engage with the church. Genesis, chapter 2, verse 7. And he says, yes, yeah, if you start verse 6, yes, you can read if you have time. He says, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the earth. The other versions called it mist. Mist used to rise from the earth. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Verse 7 is our scripture. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. That is the first time now you see the church is getting involved with the Holy Spirit. When he breathed the breath of life into him, then he, he became a living being. That breath of life is the Holy Spirit of the Lord that entered the newly constructed man, newly created man, and life came to him. So the other role of the Holy Spirit, number five, is to bring life to the church. He gave life to the church, and you see the breath. So the breath we have, the breath of life, is when God did blow into the nostrils, the, the nose of mankind, and the Spirit of the Lord came to man. The breath of life, the breath, gave him life. The book of First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, blessed people. During this lunch hour, I thought it was important to share with you a little bit. 
as you prepare to go back to your offices to share with you on what the Lord is saying now. We don't have much time and I have so much. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 45. I'll read it real quick. 15.45 He says the following. He says, So it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last, Adam, a life-giving spirit. It is very powerful that uh, when the Lord came to us, Jesus came to us, He came as a life-giving spirit, the spirit of the Lord giving life to man. And when you read the book of Ezekiel, chapter 47, verses 1 to 6, it talks about the life-giving river that flows from the throne of God into the four ends of the earth, the life-giving spirit of the Lord. Now, the book of Job, and also uh, the, the book of Job, chapter 33, verse 4, also talks about the life-giving spirit of the Lord, how he gave his breath unto mankind, and the spirit of the Lord gave life to man. If you go to the book of Job, chapter 33, Job 33, and you go all the way to verse 4. Job 33, verse 4, beloved people, as we wind down, on the role of the Holy Spirit in the church. I'm just connecting you to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Job 33, verse 4, it says, The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. So, so it is the life-giving Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit comes to give life. And, and the book of Ezekiel 37 also says, The breath of God, the Spirit of God, brought the breath of life into mankind. Now, let us look at the engagement between the church and the Holy Spirit. Because Christ Jesus himself promised the church, he promised the church that he would send his Holy Spirit. John chapter 7, verses 38 to 39. Christ Jesus promises the church that you are going to send the Holy Spirit. John chapter 7, beloved people, verses 38 to 39, and he says the following, in the book of John chapter 7, verses 38 on, again, chapter 37, and he says, again, John chapter 7, verse uh, 38, this is what he says, the people. He says, uh, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow, will flow from within him. And then verse 39 he says, by this he meant the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, whom those who believe in him were later to receive. Up to the time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus has not, had not yet been glorified, and he had not yet left. So the Lord Jesus promised the church that you would give the church the Holy Spirit. You would send the Holy Spirit. And the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 4, he said, he would not leave you would not leave them as orphans. You would not leave them alone. You would not leave them alone, but he promised that they would have a comforter. And so, when he left, then the promise came, and he said it would be good for them that he leaves, because then the promise would come. So he told them they should never, ever leave Jerusalem until the gift comes to the church, comes to them, meaning the Holy Spirit was the one to come and empower the church. In fact, he told them not to do ministry, not to begin ministry, not to do church, until the Holy Spirit comes to them. 
And surely when it came to them, then they were empowered. And uh, at that time on now, the church began. So the Holy Spirit runs the church. That's another role of the Holy Spirit. But if you read the book of John chapter 14, verse 18, real quick because of time. John 14, 18, it gives you another role of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, verse 18. This is what he says. He says, in fact, from 15 on is very important, but verse 18, he goes on to say, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And if you read from 15, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor. Now he calls him counselor. That's why I define the counselor. And I say it, which means he comes to advise the church. He comes as one the church can consult with the consultant. He comes as a guide to guide the church. He comes as the confidant of the church, someone you can confide in and ask him things, what to do. He comes as a, a mentor of the church, the aid, the helper, the trainer, the teacher, the tutor, the instructor of the church. And this is the promise he gave here. So the Holy Spirit is a counselor in the church. But when you read chapter 14, verse 27, he now comes through for peace. Verse 27 is this, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give you, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So, this counselor he was bringing, he said, would bring peace. So the Holy Spirit brings peace to the church also. No matter the turbulence, no matter the persecution, the Holy Spirit is the one that comforts the church. And then uh, verse 26, he teaches the church. He reveals God to the church. Let's look at verse 26, the book of John 14. And he says very clearly here, beloved people, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said unto you. So you see, the Holy Spirit comes to teach the church and essentially reveal God to the church. And in so doing, the Holy Spirit brings faith, belief, belief first of all, and then faith. Now people begin to have faith. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. And then it brings obedience to the Lord, to the Word of God, and then it instills holiness and righteousness. But there is a process. So if you look at John chapter 16, verse 8, that is the counselor. That is how he works through the person. Conviction of sin. He makes you convicted to your sins and then you feel a conviction that no, I think this is wrong. And then he leads to repentance and he makes the sinner aware of sin. And then Romans chapter 8 verse 26 he makes the believer sensitive to sin. Sensitive to sin and now always Repentant. He makes the believer repentant. And Galatians chapter 16, verse 20, chapter 5, verses 16, 23, the Holy Spirit also helps the church to bear fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. So how does all this work, beloved people? Let me summarize it for you again. We have seen how the Holy Spirit brings Christ the Messiah to the church. He brought us the Messiah. He brought us the Savior. And when the Holy Spirit brought the Savior, he also led him to the cross and empowered him through his ministry and led him to the cross to die for the sins of men, to fulfill the role and mission of the Savior, to bring the covenant of grace. And after the Holy Spirit brought the covenant of grace, now he also resurrected him at that day. 
So he resurrected the church. He brought resurrection to the church. He resurrected the Messiah, brought the Messiah, empowered the Messiah, who kept the cross and resurrected him. So the Holy Spirit is the most important gift, the single most important gift that the church ever received. The greatest gift in the church is called the Holy Spirit. And so, how does he work? He works in the hearts of men and women, and he restrains the dominion of darkness. We have seen how he has kept the Antichrist away for all this time and from being revealed and that dominion of wickedness, in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Number three, he convicts the world of righteousness. We don't have time because of time. I'm reading John chapter 16, verses 7 to 11. This is what he says here, John 16, 7. But I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment in regard to sin because men do not believe in me. And so do not believe all that. So he brings conviction, beloved people. He convicts the world. I say he works in the hearts of men and women. He restrains the dominion of darkness. I'm looking at the role of the Holy Spirit in the church after bringing Christ. And then, and resurrecting him, empowering him and doing public ministry, strengthening him to resurrect people, uh, strengthening him to do miracles, to move him until he resurrected him. And then in the church, he works in the hearts of mankind. He restrains the dominion of darkness and wickedness. And the Holy Spirit convicts the world, he said, of sin and righteousness, of guilt and of judgment. The righteousness and judgment, and you see, in response to this, now look at the role of the Holy Spirit here. When the world now responds to this conviction, to sin, convict them of sin, of their wickedness, and righteousness and judgment, when they now respond to that, that is when people lead their lives to Jesus. That is when salvation is received. So you can see how powerful the Holy Spirit is. Then he brings salvation to the hearts of men. Once they are convicted, you give them the gospel, they tremble, they are like, oh, I, th I, think, I, I think this way is not right. I need to receive the Lord. Yes, I'm tired of this. And then now salvation comes through that conviction. The Holy Spirit, after convicting the person and they receive Christ, then now the Holy Spirit now moves into their heart and takes home, takes residence in their heart. Now it starts to live in their heart. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 9, again, 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, verse 13, again, we are aware of this, the, the scripture on avoiding sexual sin, 1 Corinthians, chapter 6. Verses 19 to 20 says, Know ye not that you are not your own. You have been purchased. Your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So he moves in and he lives now in the hearts of the believers. Once the Holy Spirit has moved into the heart of the believer, the next thing he does is that now he helps them to fill them for eternity. Then, you see, that is now the justification, sanctification and justification when they now become the children of God. So he seals them for eternal life. And then he comforts them now in the process because now he's a counselor to them. And then he reveals the deeper truth to the church to understand the word of God, to interpret the word of God. And then he brings gifts. He brings gifts to the church also. He brings gifts now. You see, he brings prophecy. He that speaks with you is empowered by the Holy Spirit to bring prophecy, and uh, he gives it to tongue, the genuine tongue, not the false tongue you see in the church today. So, beloved people, because of time, we will continue this conversation another time, but you can see really, really how central the Holy Spirit is in the church. Then the question becomes, are you in field with the Holy Spirit? Are you in a place where you're sensitive to sin and you're convicted to sin and that conviction leading to repentance? And you can see very clearly that he's so central. He even brought up Christ Jesus. He empowered him to do his public ministry and he resurrected him and he's the 
one that has given us the hope for resurrection. So the Holy Spirit is a centerpiece, is a central, is very central in Christian life, and that's why God the Father said, you cannot touch him. You cannot grieve him or blaspheme him. You'll never be forgiven. And Jesus also warned that you cannot touch him, cannot grieve him or blaspheme him. So may the Lord bless you, beloved people, and may you embrace the Holy Spirit in your Christian life. Thank you, Shalom.